Hello and welcome to thehawkeye.org. My name is Nick Fiorillo and I'm Editor-in-Chief of The Hawkeye. We're joined today by Edmond School District Superintendent Dr. Nick Brossett. Dr. Brossett, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate it. Um, first, we want to just ask, what were you like in high school? What, what kinds of things were you involved with? And did you know out of high school what you wanted to do in the future? Well, let me start with the last question. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do after high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I was involved with school, sports. I had hobbies of motorcycles and cars and, and just uh, fun social things with my friends. But um, I wasn't sure until after probably a couple years of college mm -hmm. what it was that I really wanted to do as far as a career. Okay. And that leads me to my next question. Uh, there's a big push in the district for this new emphasis on uh, post-high school planning and, and career planning. Um, after the elimination of the senior project requirement, there's, there seems to be a, a small or a, a gap there in that planning. What are some of the, the ideas that the district has come up with and what, what uh, methods are you, you the, the board investigating to try to re-emphasize this, this post-high school planning aspect? Yeah, uh, there actually have always been two separate things. There's been the senior project, which is the one that was eliminated, mm -hmm. and then there's been this uh, uh, plan for after high school. And with the uh, elimination of the senior project, really out of respect for the heavy load that students have already with increased graduation requirements, mm -hmm. which have evolved over the recent years, the sense was if we remove the senior project, then we can take a look at that plan for post high school education and, and training and try to figure out what are things we can structure, experiences we can structure maybe as, as low as upper elementary through middle into high school so that students have a better sense of themselves, a better sense of what their career options might be, and most importantly can connect the school and experience to their interests after high school. And I, I think I'm actually a good example of what we hope wouldn't happen with students where there really wasn't any conversation with me going through middle school or junior high or high school about um, life after high school. Mm. It was just a gap. And so we would go to school and participate, but we didn't understand how connecting those dots was related to a picture that we might want to draw with our life later on. So the idea of doing some transition work with students, you know, helping expose them to different careers and thinking about their interests, just that, will hopefully help them launch from high school and go to some kind of additional training, whether it's a college or a vocational technical school or military or even employment, but with some better sense of self and what their interests might be. So it's really to, to add value to the schooling experience by connecting schooling to the interests a student has for after school. A, a very legitimate question is, well, how can a person who's never been out and lived make this career decision? I don't think you have to make a career decision when you leave high school. You just need to make the next best decision you can after high school. Your, your education and your future is like building a house and you want a strong foundation and you just need to build the next level in a solid way and as you do that you'll start to understand your options better, understand yourself better and the next set of choices will make more sense. I think students that say you know, in their junior year, well, here's what I'm going to do for the next 20 years, mm -hmm. you know, they're just sort of purporting what they think at the time. Reality may happen a lot differently. And I think it's actually better to say, yeah, I don't know if I don't know, and then uh, just be pretty earnest in how you explore that. Mm -hmm. So what are some ways that you think uh, the district can help students to sort of explore their interests or develop, understand what they really are interested in? Yeah, the, the plan that we're looking at right now would actually create and structure experiences in classes. So mm -hmm. instead of it being random based on which teacher you, you selected or which classes you took and, and what they taught in a class, there would be a more standard set of expectations and a standard set of experiences that students would go through. It might be an interest inventory, something that you would do online to find out what your interests are like compared to people who have worked, to get an idea, do you want to work inside, work outside, work mm -hmm. with people, work with your hands. I mean, there's a lot of basic questions, and when you do those kind of activities, you start to be given information in the feedback about jobs and careers that might be a good fit for your personality and your interests. Again, it doesn't say it's this job in this building and you know in this room. It's it's more like a field or an area mm -hmm. that it starts to expose you to, and that gives you a path, maybe a better identification of a path that you'll want to follow through school. Again, winding your way towards a future job. Keep in mind that we're preparing students in many ways. We're preparing students for jobs that don't yet exist. Mm -hmm. 
that the future with technology and innovation changes so fast that it's likely that both of you, your, our camera person and right. yourself, will change jobs several times in your career. So we want you to have you know, the skills, the attitude, and all the, the pieces of the puzzle that come together for you so you can apply those to whatever the future brings. Sort your way through it, add meaning and value to your life and the lives of those people around you, but kind of navigate your way through that forest of choices and options in a way that works for yourself. Okay. Where do you see sort of the gaps or the weaknesses in our current um, uh, post-high school planning system? I think that everything I'm talking about happens in some places. Mm. But we're not, um, we're not organized well enough to assure that it happens in every place for every student. So it's more about bringing to scale and systematizing what I described. Mm -hmm. You know, we have students who do everything that I just described and teachers that are dialed in and counselors that are dialed in. But it's not as uniform and as guaranteed as it should be for each student every day going through our system from okay. grade to grade. So we're really just trying to make sure that there might be new experiences, which a committee will be looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not trying to recreate the senior project. So I think to link those two together is a little bit um, uh, off, but, but rather just trying to make sure that as students go through school, they can connect that experience to what they want to do after school. Mm -hmm. and we've got to start to bring in this idea of career exploration and, and you identifying with what you might want to do after school to be part of your schooling experience. Okay. My next topic I want to move on to is the McCleary decision, McCleary versus the state of Washington. Um, it was found that the state was, in, uh, it was not obeying its the constitutional, you know, order to um, to fully fund public education, and I know you were largely involved with this case. Could you talk a little bit about your your involvement? Yeah, I was one of uh, several people who were involved. Um, I was one of the folks that participated in the trial and provided testimony on behalf of the plaintiffs. Um, the plaintiffs would be the McCleary family and others, mm -hmm. and then a coalition of now 400 members in uh, various school districts, over 100 school districts in the state and lots of different groups that have come together essentially to hold the state accountable for meeting its own constitutional uh, mandate. And so again, my involvement was um, initially just to be part of the trial. I was asked to testify mm -hmm. and provide evidence and, and uh, expert opinion on various things. And then um, I was asked to be on the board that helps to sort of govern the side of the plaintiffs. And then I was elected a couple years ago as president of the news uh, board so I work with uh, other folks that are on the board and with the legal counsel, and we meet, we discuss where we're at. It's still an ongoing trial. I think mm -hmm. that's also something that's important. It wasn't just a court ruling and then it was parked, but it was appealed by the state, and then the state Supreme Court affirmed the lower court ruling, and then did something that hadn't been done in our history uh, as a state, and that is the Supreme Court retained jurisdiction and then required reports after every legislative cycle, both from the state and then from us as the plaintiffs, essentially mm -hmm. telling the court to what extent the state did or did not comply with the court order. And uh, we've been doing that for a few years now, and then most recently, this September 3rd, there was a just cause hearing in Olympia where the Supreme Court called the state uh, to task, really, mm -hmm. and brought the state in, and we were there as well, and then asked the state why the state should not be found in contempt based on the state's failure to comply with the court order after being directed, not right. asked, but directed by the court a couple times to do so. And there was uh, oral testimony, and then just a couple weeks later, the, the court came out and actually found the state in contempt and has given the state just this session, the, the 2015 legislative session, to act in a way that they were supposed to act to, be, to remove themselves from being in contempt. So we're excited. I think it's unfortunate we had to sue the state, but we're excited that the court is staying in it and in earnest wants to see uh, K-12 funding the way it should be, which we all want. And um, so we're hopeful that this legislative session will be the one that sort of breaks the ice and tips mm -hmm. the scale in terms of bringing more resources back towards K-12 schools. Right, and I wanted to ask you too about the contempt of court hearing. Are you optimistic that, do you, do you think the, the legislature will be able to get the funding, um, or do you are you worried that you know they haven't done this so far? Is it really going to happen? Yeah, your question is a great one in terms of whether I'm optimistic or not about the legislature complying with the court order mm -hmm. in this 2015 session. And there's a part of me that is hopeful because of the timeliness that we need the resources without further delay, 
and a part of me that is somewhat skeptical, thinking the legislature may actually have to experience uh, sanctions from the court if they don't comply. The court was very clear the state is in contempt and has given them the 2015 session to comply. And if they don't comply, there will be sanctions. So, so there's no gray area in the court's ruling. Mm -hmm. The drama or the question for the legislature is do they take existing funds and then send more of those funds to K-12, but then create problems in other areas? Or do they try to increase revenue somehow by um, drawing more resources from any source or multiple sources? That could be increasing taxes in some manner, creating new taxes. It could be a closing tax preferences and some of the loopholes that exist. Mm -hmm. A lot of state revenue is not collected because of um, the incentives that the legislature has given to various businesses and corporations over the years. Right. So uh, there are different opinions about what's the right policy to do. If they get, as they did last year, if they get stuck in the 2015 session over this argument of how to fund K-12 in light of all the other interests uh, that exists, mm -hmm. then we could be looking at a, some kind of a deadlock, a long session where in fact we're back out and nothing much happened and then the court may have to actually do something. Right. That's where the, if the court is, is wise enough to impose the correct sanction, that would become a big enough problem. It would give the elected officials the cover they need politically mm -hmm. to do something that is also hard. You know, we don't know if we're the rock or the hard spot, right. but the legislature is in between the two. And at one point, when, when something is, is more to be avoided on one side, then the pressure goes the other direction. Mm -hmm. Right now, there hasn't been enough legislators with the will to find the resources necessary to fund K-12. So there has to be a big enough pressure, in this case, sanctions from the court mm -hmm. or the public, a big enough pressure to push them the other direction to actually do with the hard thing, which is to fund K-12 appropriately. Right. What kind of sanctions are, are you talking about? What sort of measures could the court implement onto the legislature? Yeah, there's actually quite a range from, from minor to very severe. An example of minor uh, sanctions could be the court could restrict the state from spending money on anything else until it funded K-12 mm -hmm. appropriately. The court could rule that expenditures for other state functions and services were, were um, void and that it had to be directed towards K-12 mm -hmm. so it could get real specific. Uh, there are a couple states where the court actually ruled that the entire uh, law system for K-12 schools in those states was unconstitutional, that the entire funding system was unconstitutional and took away the authority of the legislature to actually run schools based on that set of laws. Well, that actually is the court acting within its, its purview because that, that's the court's job is to determine mm -hmm. the constitutionality of laws. And if they say, well, you've got a law that's not constitutional and you can't use it, then the lawmakers have to go back and create a new system. Uh, that's pretty serious because that could actually close schools in our state. Mm -hmm. and, and as an educator, the last thing I want to see is schools closed. I mean, my goodness, right. who wants that, right? But it's one of those big enough things, it's got enough angst to it, that it could cause the legislators and the public and people to say, oh gosh, then we better really comply, even if we have to do something hard to comply. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think this thing has been... Um, stuck and why it's taken so long. It, it's, it's been an abstract kind of idea-based conversation and it's allowed, you know, which is fine, debate is a good thing and our political process and our democracy sort of needs that, you know, exchange of ideas and, and it's not always pretty or efficient but right. it's a good system uh, compared to others but um, it also is not real fast and then it has to get to this point where there's enough pressure to create the actual change. Hmm. And that was our purpose for the lawsuit, was actually to create a reason now that was big enough and compelling enough for the state to do what our Constitution says it should be doing, what every elected official has sworn an oath to uphold our Constitution, and yet we've failed to do it for over 30 years, and in the face of court orders. Right. So, so there has to be a change. You know, you all as students and, and those that follow you uh, deserve to have a constitutionally amply funded K-12 school system. Uh, I think we do a good job with the resources we have, but, you know, just take a look at that wall yeah. in this recording room. We do not have ample resources to address all the needs that we have. And uh, we just would love to see the legislature comply sooner than later. Okay. My next question is regarding another law, um, a series of law, no, no Child Left Behind. 
we recently lost our waiver, um, and it was largely over the the issue of tying teacher scores to, uh, or sorry, to students' test scores mm -hmm. to evaluations. Um, first of all, what do you think about um, you know our, losing our waiver, and what would you have to say to people who say you know it's it's just time we should link test scores to evaluations? Why do you disagree with that? Yeah, well, it's a it's a very complicated mm -hmm. question, and not knowing your listeners' knowledge of the issues, mm -hmm. I'll just do a little background. Sure. You know, most of our funding and most of the laws that we use to govern schools come from states, and that's true in our state as well. But we do receive some federal dollars for free and reduced lunch and for various programs to support struggling learners. Mm -hmm. There's just different ways we get some federal funds. So there is the connection between the federal government and state education. Mm -hmm. It's federal funding. So one of the things the federal government did some years ago is they created a federal law called No Child Left Behind. And in order to get the federal funding, which for our district is about $6 million, which is significant, right. in a $200 million budget, it's not a lot, but $6 million is still significant. Mm -hmm. So we want the resources. So the feds created this um, thing called No Child Left Behind. And with it, a very, very strict uh, schedule of reaching the year 2014, where 100% of every student in every school had to meet or exceed a state standard, a high state standard. Right. Now this is students with uh, different uh, language abilities, different uh, economic levels, students with uh, different learning abilities, every student. It didn't really differentiate. Now part of us will say, well that's a great thing. We want all kids to exceed in high levels, and they can. But the time it takes and the level of support necessary to get all kids to that high level varies. It just varies a great deal. In any event, this No Child Left Behind law started to fall apart a few years ago. Uh, everybody could see it wasn't going to work. 2014 was coming and we weren't going to have 100% of the kids in every school and every state meeting this adequate yearly progress. Right. So there was a lot of problems at the federal level in Congress trying to figure out, well, how do we rewrite this law? It's got a great goal. Do we say it's okay to leave some kids behind? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, ideologically wise, it's really noble, but the mechanics of the actual law and the fact that it was not funded to help get all kids to that to, to that learning standard were really problematic. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, during the Obama administration, they used the Department of Education to allow states to get waivers. And in order to get the waiver, you had to sort of meet this cake recipe of criteria, one of which was a teacher evaluation system like the one we've just adopted. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and part of that was what you just described, that student test scores, the annual test scores, had to somehow be weighted and officially be part of a teacher's evaluation. Well, <clears throat> our state had a waiver, and we had all the pieces of the recipe in place, but we didn't have that piece in place. Mm -hmm. Last year, the legislature grappled with that question. Should we take standardized test scores and make it an official part of a teacher's evaluation? Now, if you want to get the waiver, the answer should have been yes, because that's what it was required. If you look at the research, though, mm -hmm. on what's best practice, you cannot take a, student, a, a standardized test score from a student to get taken once a year and then connect it back to a, teach, a teacher's performance right. and conclude with any reliability and validity that that's related to the teacher's performance or vice versa. There's too many what are called intervening variables, other reasons that affect both the teacher's performance and affect the student's test mm -hmm. scores. So <clears throat> most people who really think through the issue know that it's not best practice. It might be politically uh, interesting mm -hmm. and it might be necessary to get the waiver. But it's not best practice for teachers and not best practice for students. So there's a tension between what we know in the profession is best practice and what politicians have believed or, or tried to purport is best practice, and they're not the same. Mm -hmm. I actually applaud our lawmakers in the state, even though we lost the waiver, I applaud them for not caving in on that issue and not doing something stupid just to get out the waiver. Mm -hmm. So by not doing that, we lost the waiver, the Department of Ed took the waiver away, and then we're in back into the rules of No Child Left Behind. Now what's, what's really funny, I mean sort of funny, right. is that it was like two months after Washington lost the waiver, the Department of Ed comes out and says, well, we're not so sure about this practice of tying test scores to teachers' evaluation. Mm -hmm. So they gave a couple other states a few more years on their waiver to try to sort that out. 
And a big study that I think was funded by or promoted by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation also came out questioning the practice of taking standardized test scores and connecting those to a teacher's evaluation. Mm -hmm. So I think we're getting punished for being right and being ahead of the pack on this issue. But um, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be disrespectful of, I'm sure, well-intended people, even at the federal level. Right. But I'm not a supporter at all of the current law, No Child Left Behind. I'm not a supporter of how it's being implemented. Uh, I think that there's way more politics that's affected educational policy than there should be. Right. I mean, would you, would you want a hospital where you know what's best practice for medical treatment of patients, would you want that be, to be run by political ideas? <laughs> or by people who know, and practitioners who know, and doctors who know exactly what you should do to help patients uh, recover and to survive at higher rates. Well, it's a silly metaphor when you put it in that terms, but we have people whose only uh, expertise about school is that they went to a school making policy about what should happen in schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've flown on airplanes, but I wouldn't want to fly one. And I've been in a hospital, but I wouldn't want to direct doctors yeah. on how to do their, do, do their work. But, uh, folks, if they've gone to education, they're an expert enough to run schools. That's that's what's permeating our policies now around education. Mm -hmm. And uh, people care about schools. They should care about schools. They're important. Right. But um, you shouldn't be trying to impose political views and, and unproven policies or even policies where you know the research doesn't support the practice. <laughs> so is the solution then, do you think we need to repeal parts of that law? The No Child Left Behind law needs to be rewritten. Okay. Uh, it actually could be written more similar to how Washington had written the waiver, take, take away the standardized test scores as part of a teacher's evaluation. I actually think the new evaluation system that teachers are implementing across our state is good. I think it's an improvement over what we had. I think you do need accountability. You do need to show indicators of growth. Some kind of an assessment system that shows student growth over time is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should have to pass or at a certain level uh, the Smarter Balance Assessment as a junior in order to get out of high school to get into college. I think, I think testing is good, it, but what do we do with the results mm -hmm. and how we apply that makes a big difference. And there's so many ways to hold systems accountable without having to do what we're doing. But again, that whole accountability thing is very political and there are lots of different opinions about it. And, right. and, uh, but we're in it. It's the right work and, and all of you students are important and hopefully us adults can get it sorted out Sure, yeah. My last question is uh, regarding the strategic plan of the district. So we're in the beginning phases or we're in the process of uh, making this new plan and vision for the district. Could you briefly describe sort of what that process entails? Yeah, we actually have uh, launched this year our strategic direction, mm -hmm. which is to identify the key themes and key areas of work that we want to do going forward. Certainly effective learning in every classroom making sure that we provide equity of opportunity for students, that we address the early learning needs, and make sure that we produce graduates that are ready for life after high school. And we have work groups that have assembled around each of those four themes. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're having conversations and, and we'll be getting into conversations about what's the work we're doing now, what's working, right, and what needs to be improved, and then what should the next steps be to move that forward. One of the challenges of the Edmonds School District, and this is my 11th year here as superintendent, is we've made progress and we're a good system. There's a lot of things right about the system. Mm -hmm. But we have a challenge of scale. The system doesn't work for each and every student. I've used this sort of uh, humorously before as a way to paint this picture, but if you took 100 students on a field trip and you brought 85% back, was that successful? Right. Well, if you're in the 85%, you can say, well, that's, that's pretty good. But what if you're in the 15% that didn't make the trip back? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like our system. We have a high percentage of students who graduate and graduate on time and go off and do things after high school. We have students that do well in school and, and there are lots of ways they're involved. So there's, there's energy and resources and momentum to the success of the system as it is. And sometimes we can be, I don't know if it's complacent or just sort of rest on the fact that it's working for most people. Well, how can the system identify the students that are struggling and then support those students to also be successful? It's not taking away from the students and the success we're having, mm -hmm. but it's figuring out how to add some more support for struggling learners to help them get on the bus of success and be as successful as their peers. They want it. Their parents want it. We, we, we should be doing that. We do better at that, but we're not doing as well as we need to. So the strategic direction, like a compass, is a way to go through 
the changes of state resources and any other policy changes that happen and help keep us pointed in the right direction and looking and being mindful to the students who are not being successful to make sure that they can also achieve at high levels. Mm -hmm. And we're excited about it. We had 130 people come to the first meeting and again get organized in each of these work groups. Mm -hmm. um, our board members are serving on each of the work groups themselves so it's very connected. We have parents and students are welcome, uh, staff, people from the community, even who don't have school-aged children but just care deeply about a topic. They're coming to these meetings as well and we're really excited that that will help educate and inform and advise the system on how to how to move forward. Mm. Okay. Any final thoughts about education in our state or in our district? You know, I really appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today and you, know, you ask great questions and these are the questions that, that everybody's wrestling with. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess my final thoughts would be more directed at just students themselves. And You know, each one of us has an opportunity when we're in school to, to just sort of go through the motions or to really make the most of that time. And it's hard if you haven't been out paying your own bills and supporting yourself to understand how important the education is for all the other things that you want to do in life. Mm -hmm. So I would just encourage students to really be mindful of, of that life after high school is coming and this time that you're spending in the system now. It's your opportunity to fill up your shopping cart with as much as you can pack into it mm -hmm. and to learn the skills that you need to be successful not only in school but after and to really start pushing the questions about your interests and things that you want to do after high school. I'll, I'll share a real quick story that I think kind of catches this. I had a, a mother come into my office several years ago and she had with her her student who was then an eighth grader and he was not applying himself in school. He was, She was working harder than he was for his own education. He was just barely showing up and when he was there he wasn't doing much. And she was really frustrated because she had been talking to him as a parent trying to tell him how important school was and how he should try harder and do a better job. Mm -hmm. But he just had nothing to do with it. So we visited a bit, and we found out that he had a real interest in motorcycles. That was his passion, was motorcycles. And his view was, well, that has nothing to do with school, so what I'm interested in isn't anything about school. Well, it turned out that mom had a, um, a relative who had a motorcycle repair shop. Mm. And she was able to work it out for her son to go spend some time with this relative at the motorcycle repair shop. In which case, he was introduced to rebuilding engines and the importance of calipers and mm. measurements and displacement and gear ratios and all the things where math was very much alive in mm. that industry and in that hobby and in that interest. She said it didn't take more than a couple of months of him actually being in there working with motorcycles to understand the significance of math mm. in that environment. Well, he started high school, actually at Mount Lake Terrace High School, and he ended up graduating with 3.5 GPA and launched off to college. And she said that really connected the schooling experience with his own interests and really motivated him to do a great job through high school, which is exciting. And I think that's the, that's the magic of education. That's this, thi this thing where if I get this fire inside that I want to do something, you know, education is the way to get to that thing. And I just want kids to be excited about their life and excited about their future and excited about school, even though it's a class that doesn't seem like it's important, mm -hmm. there's something happening there that's going to be important later. And so you, you have to sort of take our word for it now, or live a little bit more and realize that, yeah, I, sh I should have worked harder in school. Okay. So, But as soon as that fire catches, and as soon as you're kind of a self-starter, and you ignite yourself to be excited about your future and your life after high school, I think it affects how you go through the process and how you go through education which would be my encouragement and my, my request that um, students would take themselves serious to the extent it's their education and it's their future and they are valuable and they matter and they should do a good job because of all those reasons. Great. Edmond School District Superintendent Dr. Nick Brossett, thank you so much for joining us so today. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it.